This is the circuit Paul Ricard, a test track in southern France. Even for the fastest and most experienced drivers, its combination of turns and gradients provides a searching examination. Imagine the learning curve, then, for a former world rally champion with precious little circuit driving experience preparing to race a Ferrari 550 Marinello in the Le Mans 24 hours. So what's in it for Colin McRae? It's a challenge. It's, uh, it's sort of one of, or if not the greatest well-known race in the world. Um, and the opportunity was there to do it with, with Ferrari, ProDrive and, and Care Racing. So it's a, you know, it's a great team. Uh, a great team of drivers I'm with and you know, it just was a, an opportunity that was there and it was something that I always wanted to do. Dusty mountain roads and muddy forests were his former habitat but in the GTS class at Le Mans McRae will be entering a radically different environment. The cars are more physically demanding to drive there's obviously more G and braking, acceleration, lateral G. The car generally has more grip than a, than a rally car would have on a tarmac surface. So physically it's, uh, it's harder. Uh, and also because of the fact that I'm not used to this type of, of racing, so I've got to adapt to that as well. Le Mans is a race where you do have a huge spread of drivers. You know, right from sort of the, the gentleman, amateur driver through to top-class professional drivers. But obviously, my, you know, my goal is to fit in at, the, at the, sort of the top level, certainly to try and be as quick as my teammates. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't want to, to let the result down because I'm not up to speed. Ricard Rydell will be sharing the driving with McRae in the number 65 car at Le Mans, along with Darren Turner. Alan Menu, Thomas Enger and Peter Cox pilot their sister car. One of the ProDrive Ferraris won the GTS class last year, and with McRae on board, this year's challenge is once again on track. Well, it's a uh, you know, great addition to the team. Obviously, he's a, he's a big personality, and he's somebody who's uh, very established in the field of motorsport. Circuit racing, to a degree, is new to him, but he's doing a great job so far. The latest in a long line of drivers from outside sports car racing to sign up for the Le Mans experience McRae is now just weeks away from achieving his ambition. Yeah, it's always had this sort of big buzz around it. I've never actually been to the race, but I know a lot of people that have been, and they, you know, they say the atmosphere there is incredible over the race weekend. Obviously, it's all quite relaxed when you're testing, and it's, there's no major urgency about anything, but when it comes to race weekend and you know, the, the hype starts to grow and the atmosphere's there, and it's, yeah, it's, going, it's going to be a real buzz. Meanwhile, in the UK, it's the calm before the storm for two younger but more experienced Le Mans drivers. Guy Smith, on the left, and Jamie Davis will be driving one of two Audi R8s in Audi Sport UK Team Velox's campaign in the LMP1 class. Smith drove the winning Bentley at Le Mans last year, while Davis took GTS honours in a ProDrive Ferrari. The tension's starting to build now. I mean, obviously, we know that... Uh... Um, the week itself is going to be very, very hectic and very stressful. And uh, as you can see, we're sort of having some chance to relax here. But uh, we know that it's going to be, it's going to be busy. It's going to be demanding. But uh, I think we're really looking forward to uh, to the week itself. Fastest at the Le Mans Test Weekend and currently topping the American Le Mans and the Le Mans Endurance Series standings, Audi UK is the team to beat. Sebring and Monza have been, you know, very, very good for the team as a whole and um, we've had a, a good result um, at Monza just a couple of weeks ago where we took the victory there and the team also had, we had a 1-2 basically so um, it was a, a really, really close race all the way through and um, I think for the team morale that's you know, very important to, to have these results and that, that gives everybody a big boost uh, ready for when we go to Le Mans. 12 hours at Sebring, 1,000 kilometres at Monza, the UK Audis certainly have the miles on the clock. The Le Mans challenge, though, is unique for car and driver. Le Mans, without doubt, is, is you know, it's one of the top three uh, most important races in the world, along with the Indianapolis 500 and probably the Monaco Grand Prix. So um, for myself personally, to win, to win one of those events is, is, a, is, a, is a great feeling. Um, I remember when I was racing go-karts, um, I raced on the, the kart circuit, which backs onto the actual uh, 
Le Mans 24 hour circuit and I remember looking across thinking yeah, I'd love to go you know, one day to be able to race at this circuit and uh, of course never really thinking necessarily it was going to happen and to race there it's, uh, it, it's a fantastic feeling. Driving the Brackley based team's other car will be three time former winner Frank Biela with F1's Alan McNish and rookie Pierre Kaffer but the senior partner in car 88 will be Johnny Herbert. After finishing second to his sister Bentley car last year, he's no stranger to tough in-house competition. It is a little bit difficult because you're obviously you're trying to beat each other, which is always a healthy thing within a team, I think, to have. But of course, you know, the engineer on the, the other car and the, and the drivers as well try and work together that they get the best setup they, they, they can, which will actually enable them to beat us. But we're trying to do the same thing. So it's a healthy thing because it actually, I think, raises the game in the team itself and I think that's an important thing going into Le Mans because we are up against two other teams as well. <laughs> Those other two teams are Audi customers, Audi Sport Japan Team Go and Champion Racing from the USA. I actually think this year's race is going to be one of the hardest in a long, long time. If you take the Audi brigade, each one wants to win and there's no reason that Audi North America or Audi Japan should you know, sit back and say after you chaps to Audi UK or vice versa. And the driver lineups are pretty ferocious. Indeed, eight of the 12 Audi drivers in action at Le Mans this year have won the event at least once. But nothing can dent the confidence of the newest of the three Audi importer teams. Um, anything less than an outright victory for, uh, for, for Audi Sport UK team Velops this year will be a disappointment. Um, we've spent enough time practicing, testing, uh, repeating procedures, etc., etc. So we're looking forward to it. Um, it's going to be tough, but uh, we're ready to do battle. And so to Le Moy itself, where the town is always welcoming, but the scrutineers are always vigilant. This year sees the introduction of new aerodynamic regulations which are being phased in by organisers the ACO. We have introduced a new regulation for LMP1 and LMP2. It is a complete new regulation with a new uh, aerodynamic rules. We changed this rule for uh, safety reasons. The main uh, changes was the width of the rear wing we reduced by 20 centimetres and also we reduced the fuel capacity by 10 litres. More on the implications of these new rules a little later. In the meantime, the four-way Audi fight in LMP1. This is the champion racing car from the US, a formidable proposition in the hands of former winner and Grand Prix star JJ Leto, 2002 runner-up Marco Werner, and three-time Formula Mans winner Emanuele Pirro. Elsewhere in the Place des Jacobins, the Audi Sport UK Team Velox squad gets the once over. The cars are weighed and calibrated, and the drivers identified. Next, it's the turn of the Audi Sport Japan Team Go car to hove interview. Third, behind the UK Audis at Monza, their driving lineup features the man closing on Jackie X's record, five time former winner Tom Christensen, with the reliable Seiji Ara and Dindo Capello a winner last year. I think that it could be really a dogfight between the four cars um, for a long time. But on the other hand, you also have teams always improving, like the Pescarolo, um, and uh, you have the Dome and the Cytec Reynard. And I'm sure they will be ready to bite if there's any mistakes uh, going on with, uh, with the Audis. In a somewhat underpopulated LMP2 class this year, the WR Peugeot is among the cars to return, along with the likes of Paul Belmondo's Courage. In GTS, the battle lines remain the same as in the past few years. In the red corner, the two pro-drive Ferrari Marinellos, featuring that rookie from rallying Colin McRae. Lining up against them, the Corvette challenge from the Big Yellow. Second and third to Ferrari last year here, and desperate for revenge. In the GT class, only the Ferrari 360 Moderners pose a threat to the Porsche GT3s.
Drivers' briefing takes place on Wednesday every Le Mans week, and then at last, anxious drivers and teams get to put their cars onto the track. Early on, one of the quickest runners was Emanuele Pirro in the champion racing Audi. Alan McNish was looking forward to his return to Le Mans after three years away in Formula One. And Johnny Herbert was immediately right onto the pace. In a crowded first practice session, quick times were difficult. But immediately onto the pace was the Pescarolo Judd here of Sebastian Bourdais, this year with the five litre engine after using Peugeot engines for many years. Equally quick was Soel Ayari, his teammate in the number 18 car, and the Formula One refugees Wilson and Furman in the number 16 Dome Judd. Also quick was Martin Short in the Dallara. Having done uh, Sebring 12 hours and finished fourth behind the Audis, um, we're going we're gonna to be pushing reasonably hard to do well. And my goal is to be the best of the non-Audis, uh, and I think we can, we can do that. Ambitious targets for the small British team. Andy Wallace was pleased to be sharing the Zytec with David Brabham. So far the car is not bad, we can improve it. We've um, done some changes uh, from the pre-qualifying and Monza from here. And uh, we just need to fine tune what we've done to make that next step. And with all the running that we've done and the test bench, the stuff that they've done back at the, uh, the workshop, you know, everything's been pretty reliable. The only thing is we've not done a 24 hour test. The Zytec, a very nimble little car, and a quick time was expected out of them before the end of qualifying. In LMP2, the WRs were back. But all new cars were the Courages, the dark blue Pure Works car and the red Semi Works car, which had had a new engine fitted to replace the troublesome Mechachrome JPX. This one was to be driven by Jean-Marc Gounon, acknowledged Le Mans expert. The air engine is a well-known engine. Uh, suddenly, in the, you know, we did a two, two straight line on the pit, on the airport this morning, and suddenly the car is fast. Also, uh, it proves one thing: the Courage team did a fantastic job because you don't have to forget they have to come from a V6 atmospheric to a, a four-cylinder turbo with the exchanger and all the things to change. It's an hard and tough job to do, and they did uh, perfectly as, as usual. Jean-Marc had put a smile back on Yves Courage's face. These cars have a lot of downforce at the front, and we had to do a lot of work to get things balanced. But now the car is more stable. We have a car that is good to drive. You should hear the drivers, particularly Jean-Marc. When he comes back in, he says this car is perfect for Le Mans. As dusk began to fall on the first day, McRae needed to find out about driving at night. I mean, that was one thing that everybody mentioned to me, but, you know, it didn't really faze me at all. But uh, I must say, though, the lights in these cars aren't quite as good as they are in rally cars, but the circuit's fairly well lit up at night. Uh, and it's... The only difficulty at night is judging the distances between the cars that are catching you and, and sometimes the cars in front as well. But uh, apart from that, the night driving's not too bad. An international superstar admitting there's something to learn and they'll need to be quick up against the might of the General Motors factory Corvettes who, though they were quick at the test weekend, are surprised to find the Ferraris are catching up again. The team's been strengthened by the arrival of Jan Magnussen and Max Pappis and led again by Oliver Gavin. I think has maybe closed the gap a little bit to us uh, from pre-qualifying. Um, so I think it's going to be a good, close, hard race. Indeed it is. And qualifying was even closer than Oliver thought it was going to be, with Thomas Enger just pipping the quickest of the Corvettes right towards the end of Thursday's qualifying. It will be a really hard race until the end of, of, of the race, so we have to fight, but we are looking forward to this battle and we want to, we want to step up on the top of the podium on Sunday afternoon. 
in the smallest class, the GT class, this, the number 90 car, was quickest of all, with Sasha Marston, Hog Bergmeister, and young Patrick Long from the United States. They were just a shade quicker than the Ferrari 360 Modena, fabulous lap from Jaime Melo, who then led a horde of further Porsches. The Morgan and the TVRs were a little bit further back down the grid. After two days of qualifying, and amongst intense competition between all 12 Audi drivers, the man who emerged quickest was Johnny Herbert. In the past, I haven't probably focused on it before because I've always wanted to get the car very good for the race, mm. which I always think is very important. But this year, yes, I have focused much more on trying to get the pole position because it is a special, a special pole position here at Le Mans with the history and the, the drivers that have had the pole position. So, so I'm very, very happy that I've been able to, uh, to achieve that. Justified self-satisfaction from Johnny Herbert. So, after two days of qualifying, the UK Audis emerged on top, just in front of the very rapid Zytec, the third Audi, and the Pescarolos. Courage is dominant in LMP2, Ferrari sandwiching Corvette in GTS, and Porsche sandwiching Ferrari in GT. So that was qualifying. Friday's a rest day and a chance to catch up elsewhere. Team Nasamax can claim two unique distinctions this year. Apart from being the race's only renewably fuelled entry, the new Nasamax DM139 is the only LMP1 car to meet all the new specifications being introduced by organisers the ACO. The major difference between this year's car and last year's car is that the new car complies to the LMP1 regulations, which are all new for 2004. We've also taken the opportunity to take a new engine integrate installation and we now have a Judd V10 5 litre. Um, we have a new gearbox, new transmission, a six speed Ricardo transaxle which operates with a paddle shift controlled by the driver at the steering wheel. Um, these, are, these are essential changes really for the new car but not a requirement of the new regulations. These are essential parts of our development and improvements to the car over last year. The aerodynamic regulations are where the major effects of the new regulations come in and they can be seen mostly from the bodywork that we'll show you in a minute. The first thing that they've done is we have this now 50, 50 millimetre step in the splitter. So the splitter can never get too close to the ground and the front downforce remains much more stable. And you'll see this feature on all cars, it's a mandatory feature for all LMP1 LMP2 cars. The secondary feature is the underfloor aerodynamics. Previously, sports cars had a flat bottom from axle centerline to rear axle centerline. Now the cars have a shaped floor with a plank running from front axle to rear axle, and it's uh, 20 millimetres thick. And that's to maintain a certain ride height above the ground, so again, the car's restricted in its way that it generates downforce underneath the car. It's made of a material called Jabrock, which is a very high-density material, uh, very hard wood that uh, wears very well. It's also very, very heavy. This plank weighs about 26 kilograms. With the new feature with the floor, there's a seven degree angle to the floor that comes up from, the, from a, an area a metre wide underneath the car and it finishes in this 50 millimetre radius. Again, this is a mandatory feature in the new regulations. At the same time, the regulations decided to take the route that car, sports cars should go back to looking like sports cars and have a symmetrical cockpit and a symmetrical look about them rather than the single-seater asymmetric cars that we've seen in recent years. And you can see that this car addresses that in the, the fact that the cockpit is completely symmetrical other than the head protection equipment, which is a secondary installation. But any of the roll hoop structures and the main roll hoop structure must be symmetrical about the cockpit centerline. As well as the major changes at the front of the car, the aerodynamics at the rear are very different also. We have a different specification of rear wing. The rear wing is much shorter in its cord now. It's about 70% shorter than what you were allowed to run before. The height of the rear wing is still very much the same, but the overhang, its position relative to the centerline of the rear axle, is much further forward. And that's to prevent people from having a long tail with a large wing hanging a long way out the back of the car, creating quite a large cantilever. Also, underneath the car, we now have two separate tunnels as opposed to one shallow diffuser. And these tunnels run forward past the transmission and past the engine almost to the rear bulkhead of the chassis. The other area we have at the rear are these two mandatory plates either side of the diffuser. And this area is fixed by the regulations. The shape of things to come. After the compromises that had to be made en route to its appearance at Le Mans last year, the first ever by a renewably fuelled car, 
The bioethanol powered Challenger is now competitive. Eighth at Monza is testament to that. Power and speed seem very good. Uh, the new regulations do compromise performance from the handling point of view. Aerodynamics are limited and also chassis balance tends to be limited. But we accept that because, again, it's the new regulations and hopefully it will slow everybody else down eventually as well. Although only 14th overall in practice, the new Nasamax remains the fastest car on the track in a straight line. One of the features of the new regulations is to actually limit the downforce. And you lose about 20% of the downforce as the LMP900 cars run, for example. Well, obviously losing that amount of downforce, you also lose the drag that associates with that downforce. So if the engine is good on power, and under the LMP2004 regulations you're allowed a larger restrictor, that means you, ha you do have an increase in power over the LMP900 cars. Um, and on a low drag circuit such as Le Mans, a reasonably low drag circuit, low downforce circuit, it, then it does show up. While it burns more cleanly than gasoline, reducing harmful emissions, the car's bioethanol fuel contains only 60% of the energy of gasoline for the same volume. For tomorrow's spectators, with an hour or two to spare on Friday, there's always something new to see at the Circuits Museum, an evocative collection of cars, of racing memorabilia and art stretching way back into the race's past. New this year is an exhibition of black and white photographs featured in a recently launched book. This year we decided to show an exhibition of uh, black and white uh, photographs which have been shot with uh, a machine from the 60s and this uh, give a special look on the Le Mans race because all these photos have been shot last year. It's really impossible to know when, if it is last year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 or 40 years, you see people on camping chairs with big hats and you cannot know if it's a photo of the 50s or of 2000. <laughs> well, some of the photos may be easier to date, but all of them serve to underline Le Mans' unique and timeless appeal. The museum's collection is being improved and extended all the time. This year's race week saw the presentation of a more recent classic, the all-conquering Audi R8. This is the car driven to victory by Tom Christensen, Frank Biela and Pirro in 2002. Two persons to come and represent us. We have asked Mr. Jackie X and Mr. Reynolds Joss and finally, recognition from the new president of the ACO for two more Le Mans greats, six times former winner Jackie X and legendary team boss Reinhold Joost, who received this year's Spirit of Le Mans awards. X is more closely associated with Le Mans than anyone, but what's his assessment of this year's race? It's not difficult to say that most probably it's going to be an Audi, but Le Mans is Le Mans as well. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, another goal may uh, be uh, Tom Christensen, for example, who is a fantastic guy, or may really uh, equalize, I think, uh, tomorrow or the year after, equalize uh, the record of victory. And more than that, I think he has a real chance to win uh, and beat that record, and that's what I wish him, really. So can Tom pull it off and draw level with Jackie X? It's the eve of the race, and this is the town centre driver's parade.
Proof of Le Mans' British flavour is invariably provided at breakfast time. Some 60,000 Britons head for the south each year to share campsites with sports car enthusiasts from all over Europe. No European politicians and constitution here, just mixing in the campsites. On the morning of the race, and with the final warm-up session over, there's some additional entertainment on offer in the form of a historic race for Group C GTP cars, featuring wonderful cars from the 80s and 90s. This ambitious race has been put on by the Motor Racing Legends group on behalf of the ACO, but it's quite a risk. Normally, historic races have been for cars of the 50s or 60s. These cars, built between 1983 and 1991, are some of the fastest cars that have ever raced at Le Mans. Indeed, the yellow car lying second there on this, the warming up lap, now belonging to Charlie Ag, held the outright lap record at Le Mans in a pre chicane Le Mans that's never been beaten. These cars are extremely quick. 36 cars on the grid, a wonderful selection of Jaguars, some of them in the evocative silk cut colours, Porsches, Aston Martins, Nissan, Argo, Spices, Lancia with a Ferrari engine, the Aston Martin Emca, and rarities such as March, Tiger, Ecos, and Barden. It's a great grid, and congratulations to Jim Graham for putting it together. As they come up and take the green lights and accelerate away, that's a lot of horsepower. Early to show at the front is Gary Pearson in the Jaguar XJR11. He leads from Charlie Ag in the Nissan. And then it's Justin Law in the Jaguar XJR12. And that's a shame. Car 103 is the Barden. Just finished an expensive restoration and not running here today. Now then, these are the remarkable Lancia Martinis. These cars date from 1985, and there's a father and son combination in two cars, numbers five and six. That was Richard Bryan in the turbo three-litre Ferrari engine Lancia, a wonderful car. And there's drama straight away, and expensive drama for American Nick Reaney, who appears to have backed his XJR12 into the wall. And car number 88, the Nissan, also out. These cars are very fast, but they're very fragile. And prepared as they are now by amateur teams, that's a hard, whoa, an exciting moment there. Justin Law absolutely determined not to let Nigel James get past him in that low down drag, new man sponsored. That's a late 80s Porsche. Accelerating away alongside him, those two really at it, hammer and tongs. Justin Laws managed to pull away a little bit, but he's been closed down by the Creation Auto Sportif entered Spice, driven by team owner Mike Jankowski. The Spice right up now on the back of Nigel James's number seven Porsche 962. And a retirement there. That's an unusual car. Car number 66 was built by Aston Martin as a uh, Le Mans car back in the middle 80s, sponsored by Dow Corning. But no luck there, I'm afraid, for driver Ian Stinton. Pearson presses on on his way. But one of the cars has been looking very quick and racy all the time. It's number 64, the very rare Intrepid, built in the United States to IMSA regulations with a big Chevy engine in it. But he's come under pressure from the young British driver Simon Pullen in the Kenwood-sponsored Porsche 962. Battling it out now as they come down towards the first of the Le Mans chicane. So is that Pullen? No, it isn't. That's the sister car. That's number 11, Don Grice's car. And that was entered originally by Kramer in 1991. All the names keep coming back to Le Mans. The Martini Lancia looking very pretty. But it gets lapped by car number 26, Gareth Evans in the 956. Gareth, of course, is to race in the 24-hour race for the TVR team in the GT class. But he loves his historic machinery. And this was the one famously sponsored by Hawaiian Tropic about 14 years ago.
great sights to see these cars blasting down the Mulsanne Strait. Travelling very quickly indeed. But there's a problem here, there's a problem for one of the Silk Cut Jaguars. That's the Justin Law car that had been lying third. And that means that Gary Pearson is left pretty much alone. He's still shown Justin Law as being third here in front of the Nissan, but with Law in the pits in trouble. And that really is a problem there. That is the remnants of a Spice C2 car in its day. Who came off here? That's Alan Lloyd, the multi-millionaire British pharmacist who has a huge collection of historic cars. That's one of the quickest ones he's got, the Spice Le Mans car. And this is a drama, this is the race leader. This is Gary Pearson himself pulled over at the side of the road at the exit to Mulsanne, just by where Nick Rini's car lies damaged from the earlier incident. But that doesn't look as though Pearson's going very far with that car, which means that Charlie Ag in the wonderful, stunning twin-turbo Nissan with the STP sponsorship is out in front. Now, I think, in fact, that's Ray Malik, nowadays a team owner, but a hot racing driver in his day, enjoying a run-out in the Bovis-sponsored Aston Martin, which his team prepared in its day. But this looks like serious racing now, and it is. Nigel James in the new man yellow Porsche there, being closed down very aggressively by 19-year-old Simon Pullen, a bit of a star of British GT racing these days, and determined to wrest that third place from him, and it's now second place with the retirement of Justin Law, and Pearson out as well. So these two are now battling for second place as they come on to the start of the Le Mans famous Mulsanne straight. There'll probably be only time for eight laps. This is a timed 30-minute race for the historic cars. So these two are now what is probably their last lap, and it's all getting a little bit hairy there between the two of them. You'll notice that the red and black car has much heavier aerodynamics, bigger wing and everything else on it, because it was a multi-purpose car, this one, the Kenwood-sponsored car, whereas the new man-sponsored car, very much a Le Mans special, low wing, very slippery body. Oh, and Simon Pullen and Nigel James not taking any prisoners at all as they weave around the track, pulling away from the chicane. But the number seven car just got the edge on the young 19-year-old British driver on top speed there. But Pullen not taking no for an answer, dives back up him on the inside. Whoa! And runs a little bit wide at Mulsan. Looks like he missed a gear trying to get out of that. A little overexcited, the young man in the battle there. But great stuff, and he's pulling all over the back of James as they come up to the final sequence of corners. He's determined to have a go, but that is it. A huge slide across the line, but he is. So, second, Nigel James, and third, Simon Pullen in the Porsche 962 CK6. And the winner then, Charlie Ag in the From Our sponsored Nissan as he plunges into Indianapolis, taking care of the marshals saying, please avoid some of the cars parked on the side of the track. That was the Argo. But Charlie Ag helped bring this great grid to Le Mans this year, delighted, and justifiably so, with a great win. So, evocative stuff from the Group C era of just 10 to 15 years ago, and a podium for Ag, James and Pullen. So, from the historic to the present day, the class of 2004 line up for the driver's photograph. Not long to go now, as the drivers are all presented to the crowd. The national anthems are played. The drivers wave, wave their flags. It's dry, it's clear, if not particularly hot. Indeed, it's a little bit windy, but that'll suit all the drivers for the beginning of what's going to be an extremely long 24 hours. And so it's time to get serious. The crowd are gathered all around the start line. There's a big crowd on the grid, lots of sponsors, partners, associates of the teams want to be there with them, but any moment now they're going to have to get off and let the real business begin. 
At the front then, the Audi UK cars, first and second in front of the Zytec. Good performances there by the Courage AER, which was 12th overall and led the LMP1 class. And car 66, great performance by Thomas Enger to lead the GTS class. And flicking on down through the grid, 48 starters in all, and four of them, for various technical infringements in qualifying, have got to start from right at the back of the grid. The Paynos, the WRs, both of them, and the Lola Caterpillar. Various problems mean they must start from the back. So we're all set, the grid's clear, Audi pace cars front and rear, Monsieur Poissonneau waves his green flag, and everyone is released from the grid. The prototypes all move off in good order, everyone got their headlights on, and the first thing they've got to try and do is get some heat into the tyres. Not nearly as hot this year at Le Mans as it has been in previous Junes. Alan McNish there weaving from right to left as he gets on to the beginning of the Mulsanne straight in order to try and make sure his tyres are up to temperature at the beginning of the first lap. An early sight there of the Judd-powered Lola and the Corvettes and the Ferraris right up close preparing for a great battle. Alan McNish's distinctive tartan helmet, a welcome return to Le Mans after his three years in Grand Prix racing. And as they come back round to the Ford chicane, the pace car's getting ready to pull off. The tricolour is waved. It is four o'clock and it's go. The two British Audis getting very close as they accelerate away together. Certain honour to get up to the Dunlop Bridge first on the first lap. It may be 24 hours of endurance, but it's also 24 hours of very close sprints. Each section, each section of the course, each stint for each driver, treated nowadays like a Grand Prix. The Zytec in third there, splitting the four Audis, with the Domes and the Pescarolos closing up from behind. Davis and McNish make their way out onto the beginning of the Mulsanne Strait. The Zytec not expected to hold off the Audis for long. They're not trying to run for outright pace at the beginning. And indeed Andy Wallace moves over in gentlemanly manner to let through the Audi Japan car and the champion racing car. So by the time they're through the first chicane, the Zytec is already down to fifth. As many expected, it's four Audis in the lead halfway round the first lap of Le Mans 2004. JJ Leto being given a hard time there by Dindo Capello. And behind the Zytec then, it's the first of the domes, the first of the Pescarolos, and the red and black car there in the distance, the Japanese entered and driven dome with the Mugen Honda engine as they pull away from Mulsanne corner for the first time, the two British Audis are out in front. Leto going quickly in third place, and Capello being closed up on a little bit by Jan Lammers in the racing for Holland checkered black and white coloured dome. So after Indianapolis, it's down to Arnage corner for the first time, one of the slowest parts of the track, and accelerating away from there, battle is joined among the prototypes. Through the Porsche curves, Davis still has his lead over McNish. Very popular viewing spot there, packed car parks, camping grounds, as the spectators hang over the edge for the opening laps of the Le Mans 24 hour race. On board with McNish, past the pits for the first time, a quick check at his pit board. And trouble, trouble very early on for Nigel Greensill in the TVR Tuscan. The engine just cut out and he's coasted into the pits. We hope they can get that fixed quickly. And in the GTS battle, exactly as we hoped, two ProDrive Ferraris just in front of the two Corvettes with the Lab Competition Ferrari just behind them. Top five order in GTS. After just five laps, the Audis have it. One, two, three and four. 
from Sebastian Forde in the Pescarolo Judd and the Japanese drivers in the dome with the Mugen engine. Very quick in the LMP2 class, Jean-Marc Gounon in the works and Lassarth sponsored Courage with the AER engine getting into a little bit of a tangle there as he gets past the Lister. And as the teams begin to think about their first fuel stops, we see the Nasamax much happier this year that with their 135-litre tank of bioethanol, they've got full fuel equivalency with the 80-litre tanked petrol engine cars. The Nasamax running nicely inside the top 20. First pit stop for Jamie Davis, who's driven a very quick opening stint. No problems, all regular stuff. And great black trails of rubber and neatly out of the pit lane. Oh, but a little flashback here to see what happened to JJ Leto getting very over enthusiastic there in pursuit of Alan McNish. Spreading stones all over the track, and stones all over the track are the problem. Car number 75 in the GT class with a puncher. The sharp gravel causes havoc to racing tyres. And in the GTS class, everybody pits together. Big strategic battle this between the Corvettes and the Ferraris. They're all watching each other up and down the pit lane, keeping an eye on each other. Through all they do, both Ferraris neatly refuelled. Headlights back on, please. And back they go out. But the Corvette, having come in third, has gone out first. But the other Corvette has got a problem. We were going to Tarnage, the slowest corner, a little slippery. I was on the outside, and uh, I, I kind of got distracted. And I got a little too hot, and it was the first lap out of the pits. And thought I had it under control, but we just touched the tires and wrecked the nose box. So, but it, my mistake. Ron Fellows there, being extremely honest. One of the reasons why the fans and the press like him so much. Corvettes do lead Ferrari in the GTS class, and in GT, Porsche number 90 is holding the lead. And it's a problem here for the little WR that looks like a puncher. If you look at the angle of the other wheel, yep, it's very hard to get round the chicanes on a puncher. Jamie Davis working very hard indeed. Fantastic cornering speeds in the Audi R8, as you can see. And the speed at which he closes on the back markers here, the Morgan, really, truly the back marker, is just terrifying from the onboard camera. Callum Lockie there, giving himself a fright. The enormous torque of the diesel engine in the back of the number 10 Lola catching Lockie out a little bit there. The class leading Ferrari wails on its way. And Jean-Marc Gounon absolutely dominating the LMP2 class. He was over 10 seconds quicker in qualifying than anybody else in his class. He'll be sharing that. And look, we've got a problem here. The two Audis, there are two Audis in the barrier, in the tyre barrier. We're just And somebody else, there must be oil down. There's oil down on the track. One of the Ferraris has spun off as well. Can't quite see who that is. He's safely on his way again, but there are two Audis in the wall, and that's McNish's helmet. McNish has clambered out of the cockpit. He's gesturing, and that's JJ Layton at the wheel. And the yellow flags are out. But it's going to mean a safety car, a safety car required in order to extract those two Audis. This is very early on in the race and after years of assuming that the Audis would always have it their own way, two of the four cars are in terrible shape. There's JJ saying to the marshals, nope, that's the way I want to go. Guy Smith from the other Audi UK car looking on to see what's happened to his teammates and that, the number eight car of Alan McNish, is very second-hand indeed. Alan looking around to uh, see where it is they're taking him to, but he doesn't know, is he going to be able to start this again? The front end's obviously taken terrible damage. JJ's managed to drag the champion racing Audi back into the pit lane. And the horns blare and a sympathetic crowd claps as Alan McNish valiantly tries to get the number eight car back towards the pits. That's very badly damaged. And JJ's car smashed at the front. There was uh, no flags. The whole corner was full of oil. Both me and Alan, you know, couldn't do anything. 
something. That was, it was like hitting the ice. Well, there is McNish. He has got the thing back. It's a crab-like motion. That car is very badly damaged indeed. He tries to turn it into the garage. That's one unhappy Scotsman. He jumps out of the car. Let somebody else sort that out from now on. Side pods completely shredded. There's a lot of work to be done to this car. And that's McNish lying on the ground, being attended by the doctor. We hope he's all right. The ambulance coming to take him away. That looks like a precautionary measure rather than a real drama. We hope Alan's OK. So, back to the race. Now free of the safety car in the LMP2 class. Gounon in the red car there. He's absolutely miles in front of the competition. And meanwhile, back in the pits, the leader is in. Jamie Davis, after his extremely quick opening stint, hands over to Guy Smith. My stint was good, you know. I mean, uh, done a tripled start, and um, the car's working well. Had a good start. Uh, held the lead on the first lap and then just uh, kept got my head down basically and then just pushed. We just got to keep on now, keep our head down and get on with our you know with our race. I mean it's unfortunate for the team and for the other car crew, but hopefully you know Alan's okay and they can get uh, the car repaired and back out. Davis really has impressed on his opening stint at the Mall. So 88 leads from the number five Audi Team Japan car. GTS, the Corvette is just a little fraction in front of the two Ferraris. And in GT, the number 90 car, the White Lightning car, has it all its own way. And there's a problem for David Brabham at the wheel of the Zytec. That looks like a puncher. And you've got to hope that that puncher is not going to do just what it is doing now, which is shredding the back end of the car. That was out of Darnage. It's a long way to go. And John Field there, he's made a mistake. The Banana Joe's American entered Lola with the Judd engine. He's obviously got big problems. Leading the GT class, Patrick Long, the young American put in by the Porsche team. Very impressive drive. Now then, that's the champion racing car, been repaired. The distinctive pink helmet of Marco Werner has taken the car out again, while one of the Courages is refueled. The champion racing boys have done an excellent job in getting that car back on track so quickly. Everyone else having problems. There's the lister, lock up the brakes and off across the gravel. And more problems for the diesel engine Lola. Very much an experimental car, and that car is clearly either wedged in gear or has got a broken drivetrain. In Jan Lammers' dome, number 15, now been taken over by Kaneishi. And there's a problem here for the 87 car, big lock up and into the barriers. Now, that's Leo Hindery, who owns that car. He's sharing that car with Mark Lieb and Mike Rockefeller. They're very quick. He's not so quick, and he's in the barrier. And somebody else in the barrier there is the PK Porsche. That's Paul Daniels, the British driver, and for some reason, that car has suddenly just snapped him into the barrier. Looked like he was a passenger there. The number 88 car has just got a lead of about a lap over the number five car. And here at last, after losing up 24 laps, Pierre Caffer, Alan McNish's teammate, sets off. Looks like the Paynance has got problems. That's been running right at the back of the field with its team of French amateur drivers, including Sebastian Bourdais' dad, Patrick. And now there's the dome with the Mugen engine. That's got a problem. Going very slowly. That looks like a mechanical problem rather than a puncher. And all this drama up front is giving the Pescarolo boys, cars number 17 and 18, some hope for the future. Eric Comas, in fact, in number 18 car, has been very quick and has now wound his way up to third place overall. And this is McRae's first chance to race at Le Mans. He's been very satisfactory in practice. In his open face, slightly rally-looking helmet, Colin McRae sets off in car number 65 to try and claw back that deficit and get that car out in front of the GTS class. Big burden on Colin McRae's shoulders. All the expectations of his team not to make a mistake. 
now the 31 car has been taken over by young Britain's Sam Hancock after Gounon's hot opening stint. Their third driver, Alexander Frey from Switzerland, being something of an unknown quantity. Guy Smith, fast, smooth and rapid. He won Le Mans last year for Bentley and he knows how to do it. The gap over the Japanese car being held steady at that one lap. Tom Christensen now at the wheel. The racing for Holland domes with the Judd engine continue to go quickly, but not quickly enough to keep up with the number 18 Pescarolo, which holds third place just in front of Jan Lammers there. On board with the Corvettes, well, the Morgan decides which way he's going to go, giving the Corvette something of a worry, but he's past him now and pulling out onto the start-finish straight. Also with the Morgan in the GT class and the two Ferrari Moderners, the only other non-Porsches are this and its sister car. Two TVRs with their six-cylinder TVR own engine. And they've been racing steadily, but not up among the quicker Porsches. Jan Lammers trying hard as ever. The car running this year on Dunlop tyres, but very impressive indeed has been the young Portuguese Joa Barbosa, here in the Roll Centre racing entered, Delara with the Judd engine. This car first appeared three years ago at Le Mans, run by used as Shonex Areca team with the Chrysler engine. But Martin Short, who owns Roll Centre Racing, has done a great job in turning it into a very top-line privateer. In the GTS class, the Corvette and the Ferrari battling closely. Now, as dusk begins to fall, the gap between the 88 car that leads the race and his teammate is, as you can see, 22 laps. That's the amount of time that was lost in all those repairs done after McNish slid off on the oil. Satisfaction in the Pescarolo pit that they're doing such a good job and pretty much the second string car not expected to be up so high. Herbert now determined to put in a series of quick laps, consolidate the lead built up for him by his co-drivers, Davis and Smith. But you can see there just how quick the GTS Ferraris are. Problem for the Judd-powered Racing for Holland Dome Judds, working on an electronic problem, and this is going to be, yes, it is, an accident coming up. Oh, dear, oh, dear. You can see him trying to keep it out of the wall. And that is the second of the Yukos-sponsored Porsches, the two Russians for Menko at sharing with Britain's Robert Nern, and that looks like Nern who's put it in the wall. The Dome Judd losing valuable time now, four laps down from Johnny Herbert, who storms on his way into the setting sun at Le Mans. Now leading the LMP2 class after the problems suffered by the 31 red Courage with the AER engine is this car, the other Courage car, which did not change to an AER engine, but has kept the Nissan-based Wilman engine, formerly known as IES. And so after various mechanical maladies at the end of Jean-Marc Gounon's stint, young Sam Hancock gets to take the number 31 car back out of the pits and he's got a lot to do to get back up that leaderboard. The number five car holding position consistently, just its lap behind, that position not moving one way or the other. Headlights on now, and Marco Werner going very strongly as he tries to bring the champion racing car back into some sort of contention. In fact, Marco's got the number two car up from 41st position to just the verge of the top ten. In GTS, Oliver Gavin here has been doing a sterling job for Corvette. This car is now fifth overall. That's absolutely remarkable for a GTS car, particularly when we're only five hours into the race. He's got a 14-second gap, that's all, over the first of the Ferraris, number 66 here. 
and that's the Enge menu car with Peter Cox. Great shot there of the atmosphere at Le Mans as night falls. And the Morgan has got problems pulling slowly over on the side of the track there. Now these guys have got a lot of work to do, with Alan McNish OK, but told by the doctors that he mustn't race again in this year's Le Mans, Pierre Caffer and Frank Biela are going to have to do turn and turn about, just the two of them, for the whole balance of the race. That's a lot of work. Martin Short has taken over from Jua Barbosa in the Roll Centre Racing de Lara Judd. And on board with the Corvettes, through the second of the Mulsanne chicanes, It's dark and tricky as dusk begins to descend at Le Mans. And a brake lock up there, the brake lock up number five. Yet yeah, indeed, the Audi Japan car having a moment of excitement, and the dome looks to get round him. Now, Piro's going to change the nose box here. Yep, that is a whole new nose section's gone on. They're up to ninth overall. That really has been a great effort by Marco Werner. After the accident, the car was running perfectly again, and I was having fun getting back into the top ten. The car's going well, the tyres are performing very well, my compliments to Michelin, and I was able to run four stints. I think we can push on from here. As Emanuele Piro takes that car back out onto the track, the number 18 Pescarolo still in third place, looking strong with Henri, as ever, looking gloomy and worried, but he should have a little smile on his face there, third overall. In the LMP2 class, the Kouraz Wilman leads from the Clintfield Lola Judd and the troubled AER engine. GTS, the Corvettes are just shading it over the two Ferraris, and in GT, it's very close between numbers 90 and 85. The Nasamax comes in. Now, down at the end of the pit lane, so there's no confusion about what fuel goes in the car. The rest of the cars all share a common pipeline of fuel at the Le Mans 24 hours. Now in GTS then, there's been quite a big change. While the Corvettes and the Ferraris battle on track, that's not for race position. Down in sixth place is car number 65, that's Colin McRae's car. Colin has had a spin, he's been off, and in getting back on again, He's damaged the clutch and there has had to be a clutch change and that car has now lost a number of laps but is back out racing. Number 85 in the GT class, Kellners, Ortelli and Dumas, a very strong driving combination, right up there challenging for their class lead. Ron Fellows at the wheel of the number 63 Corvette, thunders by the pits. Fellows, one of the only two original Corvette drivers from two years ago, still sharing with Johnny O'Connell, but now supported by Max Pappis. And this is another big moment for Ron Fellows. And in a huge cloud of dust in that replay, we see him off into the barriers. A tremendous smack at the side, the Corvette front and rear. And that's the Belmondo Courage with the AR engine. Paul Belmondo at the wheel, the number 37 car. He's off as well. These two may have tangled just beyond the crest we can't see there. Belmondo struggling to either get out of the car or encourage the marshals to help him on his way. Now Fellows has managed to get the Corvette back into the pits, but obviously Belmondo has as well, because here is a very animated Paul Belmondo telling his engineers what went wrong. Looks a concern on everybody. The car is obviously severely damaged. He checks underneath the rear wing. It all happened at about 300 kilometers an hour. It was all pretty frightening. There were yellow flags, so I slowed down. But the car behind me didn't, and hit me from behind. I spun, touched the rail, and when I got through the smoke, I saw the Corvette right in front of me and ran into him as well. A very animated Belmondo there, clearly upset by what happened. It's not obvious to us who was right behind him, but anyway, in the Corvette pit, they're working hard on getting their car back on track just as soon as they can. Drama for everybody in the GTS class. Now that's Darren Turner in the gravel now. The 65 car already having a couple of excursions this race, but this is at the Dunlop chicane. That's Darren Turner, experienced man. He's done that all by himself. 
the 64 car, no problems so far. Unfortunately for Ron and, and the boys in the 63 car, they've, they've had a huge amount of bad luck today. And uh, it's, uh, you know, running okay for us, Touchwood. But it's, um, you know, it's very, very tricky out there right now. It always seems to be, as soon as darkness comes here at Le Mans, people start going crazy. And it's not just the drivers who go crazy. Nighttime at Le Mans is a great excuse for a party. And the quarter of a million people attending this great festival get the fun fair and the fireworks and the beer and the food. So six retirements so far as the night wears on. And Herbert hands over to Davis. And it looks like somehow Neil Cunningham has dragged the Morgan back to the pits. He's out of the car and tall, young, thin Adam Sharp's about to get in. So overall, Audi 88 leads from the Audi Team Japan car and the first of the Pescarolo Juds. And in the GTS battle, a Corvette still just shading it over the 66 Ferrari and the first of the 575s. And that's a new fastest lap for this race. JJ Leto out there in the champion racing car, 3 minutes 36.06. That's quick and it's night time. And that's a stop and go for Jamie Davis. Yes, down at the far end of the pit lane, Jamie Davis has been stopped for overtaking under a yellow flag. He's going to have to push hard to catch up from there. And a shot of former Indy 500 winner, Danny Sullivan. But here's new drama. That's Jan Magnussen's Corvette. Oh, and he just got taken out there. He got taken out by Jamie Davis. Just pushed clean off the track while Davis was pushing to make up time after his stop and go penalty. And Magnussen thumps into the barriers there. Ouch! When uh, the prototypes come up to the slower cars, they gotta, uh, you know, do it early, pull out early, and flash the lights, whatever. We don't have a lot of visibility to the back. So if they just come in and completely dive bomb us, this is what's gonna happen. So more work for the Corvette team. They really have been busy this race, and that means that number 66 Pro Drive Ferrari 550 is back in front. It's not a sunny holiday life for everybody at Le Mans. More retirements added to the list as the night takes its toll. And that's a big problem for the Zytec. The whole of the rear of the car is on fire. The marshals quickly put it out. But that is a major engine let go. There's oil all over the track. Clouds of smoke coming out of the back. Now, that could have been damage carried forward from that bodywork thrashing that the puncher had an hour or so ago. Great puddle of oil on the pit lane at Le Mans. Sadly, that's the end for the Zytec. And not a good picture there either for the Baron Connor Ferrari number 61. Those brakes, oh, will not get put out. Marshall's enthusiastically squirting it everywhere, but it's not going to do it. And they don't want to melt their plastic pit carpet. Further up the pit lane, the number 65 Pro Drive Ferrari comes in. McRae's had another spin, and he's shredded the underneath of the car. And they just need to check that all over, including the front splitter. Very important aerodynamically. Quick regular service for the Luke Alphon Porsche. Overall, then. After nearly 13 hours of racing, the UK Audi leads the Japan Audi from the first to the Pescarolo Juds and then an impressive performance by Martin Short's Roll Centre team in fourth place overall. The number 66 Ferrari leads the two Corvettes in the GTS class and an impressive 14th overall is the Kellner's Ortelli Dumas number 85 Porsche leading the GT class. So after the Zytex engine spillage, there was a safety car period, but that was cleared up after just 12 minutes. Just 36 runners left now out of the 48 starters. 
And in the Nasamax pit, they're still working on the misfire problems in order to try and get this car to run smoothly. Very fast in a straight line, but still causing problems. And problems also for the number 16 dome with the Grand Prix stars of Justin Wilson and Ralph Furman with Tom Coronel there. Johnny Herbert getting a change of tail panel. Resources that many other teams can only dream of. Rob Barf is now at the wheel of the Martin Short Dua Barbosa car number six. And they're fourth overall. A bit of a contrast in resources to Johnny Herbert here, the leader in number 88. Dawn very much broken now, and Colin McRae waits on pit lane for his next run in car number 65. The Japanese run, number 77 Porsche, has been going extremely well. They're 18th overall and third in the GT class. Oh, that's much too close. That's Sebastian Bourdais has just taken, taken Martin Short clean out of the race there in the new S's below the Dunlop chicane. Sebastian Bourdais was really travelling quickly. He just closed right up on Short, pushed him right around and very nearly took out Pierre Keffer, who has a very exciting moment there in the number eight Audi UK car. Now we hope that Martin Short is going to be able to get back on track again. But here is Pierre Keffer, who himself has spun out on the gravel and is nose on into the barrier. So all sorts of problems for Audi UK all at the same time, because in the pits here is the number 88 car, and they're working frantically on the rear suspension. There's clearly some problem with the rear suspension, so as the camera swings back to the number five Audi Japan car, they could be in a position now to catch back up. They are out there at Mulsanne, but by the time they come past the pits this time, if the Audi UK mechanics are not able to complete this work on the rear suspension in time, that will put Dindo Capello driving car number five in the Audi Japan car into the lead, and there we have it. They are in the lead for the first time, and during the stop for the 88 car, Audi Japan have put a clear lap over. Jamie Davis has been put back in. He's been consistently the quickest of the drivers, and he's put back out in order to try and see if he can close that gap down. Now they're playing catch-up for the first time in the race. So what's been wrong with the number 88 car? Basically, we, we have an understeer problem, and uh, the first couple of stints, the car's not too bad. And uh, we, we can do a good lap time. But the last stint, we have, get so much understeer, the front tyres are completely gone. And the times just go down and down and down, and then they catch us up. So um, I think it's because the push rod has gone that it's been causing the understeer. So let, uh, let's see what happens now. And that's a huge accident for Martin Short in the Dallara Judd. Yep, look, something's just broken at the rear. The left rear wheel had tumbled inwards. Oh, that's a lot of damage to the privately owned Dallara. That looks tub, rear impact, side. That is one wrecked motor car. When well, I eventually got out of the car and managed to sort of get up, I had a pot around the car, and then I could see that the suspension had broken. The left rear had broken. I realised that that had happened. Poor Martin Short, a dream ended and left to rue the costs of an error of judgment by Sebastian Bourdais. Yeah, that's cost me a quarter of a million pound race car or more and a, probably a fantastic result at Le Mans on our debut, so yeah, I'm pretty aggrieved. More dramas, and that's the champion Audi just gone straight on at Mulsan there and into the barrier, or no, no, properly slowed by the gravel, so the car's all right. Dr Ulrich there, thinking perhaps I'd better make myself scarce from this pit. And Emanuele Pirro manages to get the car back on track again up the little slip road to rejoin just after the Mulsan. In the GT class, the number 90 car, the White Lightning car, has slipped back to third overall in the night after losing 24 minutes in the pits, leaving 85 with Kellners in the wheel, leading that class. And a big lock up here for the Audi Japan Team Go car. Missed the chicane completely at the second chicane, having to weave through the tyre barriers. And the number 18 Pescarolo, still in third place, has had to come in, and it looks like work on the alternator. 
derrière, nos poursuivants doivent pousser beaucoup. The cars behind us are going to have to push very hard to catch us. If they do, well, we might have to up the tempo a little. But we want to keep a good rhythm without damaging the car. Sans abîmer l'auto. And Eric Comas takes the car back out again. Now, out on the Mulsanne, in got Christensen being very closely followed by Johnny Herbert. Herbert very keen to unlap himself. Get back on the same lap and see if you can take the battle back to Audi Japan Team Go. The Ferrari number 66 is still the class leader on the track and indeed they've got about five laps over the first of the Corvettes. That's Alan Menu, Thomas Enge and Peter Cox. The car continuing to go very strongly. So, just a little later on, there's Benoit Trelouillet putting the number 18 car across the gravel and into the pit. The uh, recovery tractor driver being woken up there and a lot of very unhappy Pescarolo men looking at what's happening on the screen as Benoit brings the car back into the pits for more work. But they been worked on, got a new replacement nose, and the marshal, whose job it is to check these things, is unhappy. He's saying, you cannot show me both your headlights, so all the mechanics have had to run all the way up to the far end of the pit lane, that's the Audi end of the pit lane, right down from the other end, and try and have a proper crack at the electrics. <laughs> Tom Christensen making a uh, derisory gesture to one of the TVR drivers. Very hard for these big GT cars to look backwards and see the prototypes coming at them so quickly. Guy Smith hammers on in the number 88 car, still keen to close this gap down on Tom Christensen. And now leading LMP2 is young Clint Field in the little Lola with the Judd engine. Some way behind the rest of the field, but uh, nevertheless in front of the class second place WR here. With 25 time Le Mans ver veteran Yoshio Tarada at the wheel. In GT, Stefan Ortelli has been very quick. He's now up to first in the category and lying a remarkable 13th overall. The whole of the Inter Porsche battle in the GT class has been very competitive. Shame to have lost Jamie Melo so early on in the Ferrari 360. The TVRs and the Morgan haven't really been in it but the battle between the Porsches has been fantastic. And fantastic too has been the progress of the number 88 Audi UK car, now less than a lap behind, just two minutes, 12 seconds behind the Audi Japan car. Well, the Nasamax screams on its way, but that does not look good news for Sebastian Bourdais. I dare say Martin Short won't be weeping, but it looks as though he's got a problem down by Pescarolo himself off the pit wall to try and discover what it is that's been going on talking to his engineering chief. They'll be talking to Sebastian Bourdais over the radio, try and find out what's going on. And a big problem here for number 66. Yeah, that is the class leading Ferrari in the GTS class. And that's not just a puncher, that's a completely locked front wheel. There's obviously a problem there with the hub carrier or the bearing, something in there. While the Corvette thunders on its way, that car has got a lot of work to be done to it. And look, it's done a lot of damage to the nose and the front splitter and so on while it was grinding its way along the tarmac. And this, of course, means that Olivier Beretta in the number 64 Corvette's got a real chance to catch up. Oh, and a mistake there by Jamie Davis in his excitement closing down on the Audi Japan car. But uh, Davis having a very exciting and very press-on race. A generous helping of gravel all over the track again. A round of applause from the spectators, and he's on his way. Tom Christensen to get out. Dindo very keen indeed to get in, urging him on, putting in his new seat. The race leader's now very keen not to lose any time to the number 88 car. After Beretta's tremendous stint, 64 is in for regular servicing, and at the same time, the 66 Pro Drive Ferrari is back out after its repairs. Obviously got the new front, yes, that's not just a whole front wheel, there's a whole front hub carrier, disc, the whole lot. And the Ferrari's first away, but they're further down the pit lane, and Beretta takes the Corvette back out and into the lead of the GTS class. The Corvette's at uh, 
had problems in the night, so I mean, uh, we are on about the same position, and uh, it looks like like uh, we we haven't been driving uh, last 20 hours because we are now very close to each other and battling for the first place. And it's not just for class honours that the battling goes on with the Corvettes. There's Jan Magnussen being taken for fifth place overall by the rapidly recovering Biela Kappa driven Audi R8 from Audi UK. In the class, the Corvette now has a small gap over the 550, just 12 seconds. Race leader is still number five from the 88 Audi and the number two champion Audi in LMP2, it's the Lola Judd. In GTS, as we were just saying, the Corvette and the Ferrari and then the second Corvette. And in GT, the 85 Yukos sponsored Porsche. Still hard at it, a very crowded approach to the Ford Chicane here, on board with the Chevrolet Corvette. And that's a rather disconsolate looking Henri Pescarolo because the number 18 car has now been pushed back from its previous podium possible position by the arrival of Audi number two, the champion racing car. It's taken over third place and built up quite a gap. And problems for the 85 car, the class leading Porsche GT of Ralph Kellner's Ortelli and Dumas having proper work done on the back end there. Capello in and they've spilt some fuel. And it's caught fire, it has caught fire. Capello looking very concerned now. He's pulled over and stopped in somebody else's pit. Marshall's running at it. Come on, quicker with the fire extinguisher, get this flame out. Capello wants to get out of the car. He's standing up in the car. But it looks as though that's just been confined just to the bodywork. Media all getting very excited, all clutching around. But there's no reason why he shouldn't get going again. And he does, strap back in. On you go, just a flash fire on the bodywork. However, that does mean that the 88 car has made up another 30 seconds or so, free and for nothing, while the number eight car continues its inexorable climb back up through the order. While Alan McNish was being checked out at hospital, Kaffer and Biela have done the driving. From the team to get it back out is one thing, but then for uh, Frankie and Pierre to run it for you know 22 hours, that's a mighty, mighty effort, and I'm just a bit disappointed I couldn't be part of it and feel you know, sorry for them in that respect because uh, at the end we, we are a team effort. And this is what Alan McNish has been missing. He's had to leave Pierre Kaffer here and Frank Biela to do all the driving. And as the race moves on into Sunday afternoon, Kaffer is still astonishingly quick along the Mulsan Strait. Kaffer's never raced at Le Mans before. He's only 27 years old, but he really came to everyone's attention when he drove tremendously well in the Sebring 12 hours in March this year. He did a great job there. He looked entirely calm and in control when he came here in April for the Le Mans test weekend. And his performance over the last 22 hours, standing in for the missing McNish, has really proven this young man's quality. The Audi R8 in a straight line, astonishingly quick and astonishingly stable. Hard braking into the second of the two Mulsan chicanes. Quick correction there and accelerating out again, down towards the Mulsan corner. And what's this? This is one of the Corvettes up against the barrier. This is on board with Johnny O'Connell. He missed the chicane altogether. Must be something of a brake problem as he couldn't stop. And in the pro drive pits, the number 66 car's being backed in. That's the Enge Cox menu car. And further problems in GTS. There's the 65 car, and that's Colin McRae, you can see from the helmet there, who's had a straight on at the first Mulsanne chicane. He's got to weave his way between the barriers as well, and McRae gets back out again, while his teammates get back out of the pits again. Routine servicing in LMP2 for the Lola Judd of Field and Binney. This time they're hoping for no refueling fires as Capello gets out and Ira gets in. 
but now more problems for ProDrive with the number 66 car. That's the second stop in within the same hour. And uh, this really is a further problem now, letting the Corvettes getting further and further ahead. So it's almost exactly a minute, the gap between the leader and this car, the number 88 car. And meanwhile, here to underline the point in GTS, with the Corvette out on track, the 63 car, after all its problems earlier on in the evening and the night, now has a chance of getting in front of the 66 car as well. The 66 car managed to set back out again, the 65 car being tidied up after its spin. A touch of inter-Audi cooperation there, as JJ jokes with Johnny Herbert. Jamie Davis brings the car in. Still hovering at around a minute, with Seiji Ara doing a nice steady job out on track. And Johnny Herbert out there to try and chase him down. Whilst Ralph Furman has an off there in the number 16 dome, straight into the barrier. That looks as though that was just a brake failure problem because he just went straight in without any real attempt at getting the thing stopped. Your Bergmeister now back at the wheel of the number 90 White Lightning Peterson Motorsports car leads GT. So there's just an hour to go. Can Ara be caught by Herbert? Will the GT class stay the same? What further dramas in GTS? Herbert hammers on, he's now just 43 seconds behind as the crowds gather near the finish line. But Seiji is a very steady man and he's not going to let himself get rattled. The Freisinger mechanics get the number 85 car back out of the pit, but they're now third in the GT class behind 90 and 77. And a nice award this for the Morgan team, for the hardest working team, which after all the dramas they've had is fully justified. Johnny Herbert there, desperate still to be making his way through the field, desperate to catch up with this man, Ara, driving very sensibly, leading the race overall. And in number 64, Oliver Gavin leads the GTS class. And here, the leader of the GT class, Bergmeister, going extremely well in car number 90, all set to take that win. Oh, and Johnny Herbert trying just that last push just too hard. Consternation in the Audi UK team while they look up at the screens. But Ara is looking very steady. It's one minute to four. He's being followed round by JJ Leto in the champion Audi. But Johnny Herbert in the Audi UK car number 88 is not going to catch Seiji Ara as the Rolex clock ticks towards the end of the race at four o'clock. Off go the fireworks, off go the smoke bombs, the flags wave. As Seiji Ara brings the Audi Japan Team Go car across the line. That means that Tom Christensen has won the ball for the sixth time. Johnny Herbert acknowledging that they've just been pit to the line. Waves to the crowd as he brings his car home. A very solid second. But Ara absolutely delighted with the fact he kept his head he kept the times at the right level, he held off Johnny Herbert, and Go has finally won at Le Mans, a great fillip for Japanese participation at Le Mans. The American Corvette team celebrates their 1-2, followed across the line by the ethanol fueled Nasamax. And maybe some way back after all their troubles, but cheering from the Nasamax team, a great result to finish at Le Mans. And so as quarter of a million people try and invade the track in order to get down to the podium celebrations, here are the final results. Audi Team Japan, car number five, wins by just less than 45 seconds from the 88 car of Audi UK. And all the way down through the field, there have been great battles. The GTS battle between the Ferrari and the Corvettes, tremendous stuff and among the Porsches for the GT title even more so. Some worthy finishers, including the Tuscans, and struggling on to the end, in 26th place overall, the LMP2 winner, Clint Field. There's Tom Christensen, a remarkable, remarkable result. A little Danish victory dance there, as you would expect. Only the second man ever to win Le Mans six times. Seiji Ara looks a little bit dazed with the sheer achievement of what he's done. 
tremendous result. And Mr. Go, the principal of Go Team, the Audi Japan Consortium, will be absolutely delighted to see his man having driven the car across the finish line. But Christensen, really a unique, unique achievement. Six wins out of only eight participations at Le Mans. The silver-haired Capello also fully deserving of that prized trophy. And just behind Seijiara there, there is Mr. Go holding up his entrance prize. A tremendous achievement. Here's Tom. I think everyone has been witness to a fantastic race and that we come out as winners. Our Audi Sport Japan Team Go. I'm really proud of being a member of this. It's fantastic team spirit. And, uh, and to Jackie X. Thank you very much, Jackie. Each of the classes gets their own podium moment here at Le Mans. And in GTS, the Corvettes did win, and there's the triumphant team. But what did Colin McRae make of it all? You, you always try and sort of anticipate what it's going to be like, but it's, uh, it's been a hell of a lot harder than I thought it would be, and uh, you know, very, very demanding and an incredible atmosphere. Yeah, it's a great challenge, and, and you're working with the, the best teams in the world and you know, top pass machinery, so you know, who wouldn't want to come back? Sounds like Colin McRae will be back. And this win will probably mean that more Japanese will be back. We'll be back next year. That's all. Hope you've enjoyed our coverage of the 72nd running of the Le Mans 24-hour race.